So actually, I think Alistair set us up really well when he was talking about you, you don't build a product and try to go find customers, you find customers and then build a product. And that's, a, I think, a good segue into our next talk where uh, Jamie Simonoff is going to share some of the 10 challenges that you're going to face uh, when you talk, to, talk about your customers and trying to figure out if, how did you put it, do they actually give a crap? So, Jamie, take the stage. Well, first I gotta get this to click. There we go. Okay. Whoa. Overclicked. All right. So um, this is one important piece I think of a startup, and startups are multi sort of prong. So take everything with a grain of salt. This is not the only thing that makes a startup successful. If I knew what that was, I would be rich and not speaking here today at all. So um, richer. Um, so. You know, I think what, what, what matters about finding out if your customers give a crap, and it's really do your customers care, that's a link baity title, um, is if you're in a startup where the customers don't care, then you're wasting your time. And if you're wasting your time, it's the only resource you have that you just can't get more of. And so that's really what you don't want to do. And where this idea sort of really, you know, came clear to me is uh, I used to have a telecom company um, and we did a lot of stuff in the third world. We built networks, and one of the places was Democratic Republic of Congo. And in the Congo, it is one of the poorest places on earth, and that's where things become really clear. And there, there's three things that people spend their money on, and those three things that are up there, those are the three things they spend their money on. It's not shelter, it's not food, it's not all the things that you think, if you said, what do, what do people that, you know, of those means spend their money on? It's cosmetics, it's beer, and it's telephony. It's mobile phones. There's people that literally do not have shelter, that are undernourished, that have mobile phones, are drinking beer, and are fully have expensive, you know, expensive makeup. Makeup's not cheap. And so it really shows what do people care about. Um, which brings us sort of to our world, which is not as clear as Congo. Congo, you know, in a place where you sort of have little, it's very easy to see what matters. And as we get more and more users and more and more things, you know, we're having like gajillions of people signing up for everything. Um, my last startup, unsubscribe.com, had 100,000 users in the first few months. It was insane. I mean, compared to what even three or four years earlier, what 100,000 users are, and today 100,000 users is nothing. So you can get a lot of users, get a lot of numbers very quickly. And also in the markets we're in, there's a lot of disposable income. There's a lot of wealth running around. There's a lot of early adopters. There's a lot of VC money. So these things can sort of cloud our vision of what really matters. What, what does the customer really care about? So we can get some early traction sometimes, get people to pay for things, but it doesn't really necessarily mean they care about our startup yet. And so I sort of look at the, the startup world today that we're looking at, typically when we go after markets. There's a lot of people now. It's sort of like Times Square. You have a lot of, a lot of distraction, a lot of people. They're coming in, and then they're going home. And so what matters is, when they go home from Times Square, you know, from your startup, do they still remember it? Do they care? Are they going to come back? And do you need them to? Which brings us to Belarus, another place we did business. And in Belarus, people call it a living history museum of Russia, because it still sort of is exactly like how communism was back in the 70s or 80s, which I was not a part of because I was too young, but that's what they say, and I was there. And when you drive from the airport to the hotel in Belarus, I mean, it, it couldn't be a more beautiful street to drive down. It's well lit, everything's painted, clean, beautiful. You get to the back of Belarus, and it's absolute poverty, disheveled, terrible, horrible living conditions, and everything else. Belarus is a total facade. So what's happening, I think, in the startup world is because we have a lot of money, because we have a lot of users, we're creating companies that are basically facades. They look great from the outside, they're great to pitch, but on the inside, they're actually crap. And so our whole goal here is to build a great company. It's what your goal should be. And so to build a great company, a long-standing company, in my opinion, you have to have customers that really do care about that company. And one of my experiences, I have a telecom business, another telecom business, that sells, uh, it's very niche, it sells directly to telemarketers and debt collectors. We specialize just on those two places. Uh, we have zero customer churn other than cu uh, customers that have gone bankrupt. And that, that company today will do about, like this year will do about 15 million in sales and make over three and a half million in profit. And the company's sort of bulletproof. And while it's not one of these companies that I, I would love to own, 
it is a great example of is a customer first company and the customers do care about our business. And because of that, I think it's why that business continues to grow and continues to do well. And I think if you look at the, the roots of a lot of companies, like an Amazon, a Google, a Star, you know, Starbucks, a Budweiser, any of these types of companies, and I tried to sort of do some tech, some non-tech, I think you see that sort of trend um, in all of these. And so what I'd like to do now is sort of go through how I judge, you know, do your customers sort of care about your business? And, and do you really have something that's sticking there? And then what would you do to either correct it or what are the steps to do to actually make it, make it better? And the first one is sort of social chatter. And I'm, and I'm trying not to use the social buzzword, but we'll use it here. It's, it's sort of, depending on the business, it could be Twitter traffic, it could be Facebook, it could be, do people email each other about it? Do they, you know, how sort of, how are people talking about your business? And that's business dependent. So in Noble Biz, which is a tel selling to telemarketers and debt collectors, do telemarketers tell other telemarketers about our service? Do they recommend our service to other people in their, you know, in our space? And the answer is yes. They're not Twittering about it because it's not something that you would Twitter about. But in a lot of these things, it, you know, it is. And, and it's not just you get a Twitter pop. So if you're looking at your numbers, if you have 30,000 tweets, did those 30,000 tweets happen the day that you had a TechCrunch article? And did they keep coming after that? Did people, did it sort of, did the conversation continue? Are the customers continuing to talk about it, the real customers, after sort of all these pops? Because these pops and all these types of things can make, can, can mask the problem. Again, it can make that facade, and then the back still is really crappy. Engagement, and this is, Real engagement, and again, it depends on your business. So some businesses are lead generation companies. A lead generation company can have a very short-term engagement that matters, where the customer cares, and make their money. If you're getting paid from Vonage, you know, $250 to get a customer, you need engagement for whatever that amount of time is to get that person to sign up for that service. But if you're doing something that needs longer engagement, if you're doing a some sort of a social network with advertising based or sort of a mobile product that's advertising based, you need that engagement to keep happening. So that download number doesn't really matter if you're a mobile app that's gonna monetize on actual usage. So then you need usage numbers. And I think that's again where people look at download numbers and forget about usage numbers and where things can uh, you know, basically get uh, massed over. And two companies that you know, I think have great sort of engagement are, would be Zynga and Tumblr. Um, you know, Zynga gets a lot of crap for a lot of things that they do, but if you look at their engaged users, the sort of amount of money they're able to get from them is, I think, directly to the side of that they actually care about the games that they're playing. They love those games and they're willing to stay on them a long time and they're willing to pay a lot to be on those games. And number three is sort of the hard one, and I think this is the best one to sort of, this just cuts through all the bullshit. You know, if you pulled the plugs on your servers or your theoretical servers in the cloud, what would happen? And I think the hard answer for a lot of startups out there is nothing. No one would care. And there are definitely examples of it. I've had my own examples of it that I will not go through, but where we have shut down services and no one cares. And they have lots of users on them. And while of course there's a little bit of like, oh, I would love to have that service again, nothing happens. No one starts a service to fill the void, nothing matters. And so recently a company in Los Angeles that was a big company called BetterWorks, which raised, I think they raised about $30 million or $20 million at I think up to a $100 million valuation. They were going, you know, going strong. Uh, everyone thought it was gonna be the first billion dollar company in LA, you know, from this tech stuff, uh, Web 2.0. And they literally just one day said, it's not that big of a market, we're gonna shut down. And they shut down, and it was like, every, the next day, nothing, nothing changed. All the customers that had them, everybody was fine. And so I think it really proved that like, they were absolutely right, that the way that they were doing their product, no one really cared about. And so they were probably right to shut down. And then you can take that to the opposite with something like a Dropbox. Like, what would, like, what would we do, if, and I'm assuming there's Dropbox users out here, if Dropbox shuts down tomorrow? cry, I don't know, I mean, you know, like you care about that service, like you, you need that service, you rely on that service. And not every service has to be that clear that it's, if it shuts down, it literally destroys you. But I do think if you have something that requires continued engagement, if you shut it down, you, either your users should be upset, 
or you should have someone immediately come into the space to take that void. And a lot of times that doesn't happen. So the question is, how do you get, how do you become the cosmetic? How do you become the beer? How do you become the cell phone uh, for your customers? And a lot of times, you're just in the wrong market. There's a lot of startups happening right now. Everyone's trying to solve every problem. A lot of problems are itches. They're not real issues. So, you know, you'll hear VCs say like, you know, where's the hair on fire issue? Um, or maybe they used to say that. I don't know if they still say it. And I think it's a great one because, you know, there's a lot of products out there where they're just not solving a burning hair on fire issue. And because of that, they struggle. Now, because there's a lot of money in the market from VCs, they can still continue. But what that means to the employees of that company and the founders of that company is that they are sitting and churning and burning their time, which again is your most valuable asset. So it's something that you don't want to do. So you really want to look at, is the market we're going after and is the product that we're putting into that market or that vertical, is that a correct product? Is that something that actually matters to the customer? And no matter how we add features to it, no matter how we change it, is the customer ever going to care enough about that product to make us into a real sustainable company? I'm not talking about just a billion dollar company. Are you going to be able to make a $10 million a year business on it? Are you going to be able to make a sustainable business on it? Are you going to be able to return money to your investors on it? And again, a lot of times the answer to this is no. And that's where, you know, pivoting happens. And, you know, you can sort of just Google pivoting at this point because there's so many companies that have done it and done it successfully. But I do think it's something that, you know, either pivoting in your market or just pivoting out of it you know, is definitely something that people still at this point, in my belief, don't do often enough. Um, you know, the next one is customer service. And this isn't just having someone answer your phones. This is a holistic, how do you view the customer? And I think it's, you know, if you're Google, yes, Google has really crappy customer service and somehow they still make billions of dollars a year. But none of us own Google here and probably we're not like Larry and Sergey. So, we should step back and be to the reality of what do we do every day? And we start little companies. And I think one of the best ways to make a little company super successful is to really holistically, from the, from the ground up, from every employee, give a shit about the customer to the point that have the customer service phone ring to everyone's desk, even the programmers. I don't care. I don't care about the distraction. Make it so that everyone cares about delivering the best experience to those customers, those early customers, for at least call it the first X months or something to when you break out to the next level. Once you do that, yeah, Google's proven. You can just put forums up and you no phone number and no customer support and people will still, you know, buy stuff from you and it'll be fine. They'll complain, but they'll still do it. But until you get there, I really think that you know, one of the best ways to build a foundation is to create those first thousand, two thousand, you know, depending on your business users, that are going to really impact and then they're going to tell the 10,000, 100,000 users to come in. And that's how you can really build a sustainable company off of that. And the third thing is to really focus on the real numbers, not just the, you know, how many apps did we download, the let's, you know, get a good spreadsheet to the VCs, let's do all this stuff. I was just with a, um, a company that, again, I, I'm... I'm Sadly, with this one, I wasn't able to name a lot of the businesses, so I didn't try to put too many in there because a lot of the numbers are not, this is sort of to the other side, which is the bad side. Um, but this company is a well-known company. They're in you know, TechCrunch and all of the blogs pretty frequently. And they've come out with a lot of great numbers that their conversion rates from freemium to paid are very high, like 30%. So I recently met with them and they were talking to me and asking me questions about how they would grow and do different things. And I mentioned some of these numbers. And the truth was, yeah, they, were, they had the ability to, to convert. They were converting from, from freemium to paid at 30% on totally unscalable, absolutely early adopter traffic. So yes, when venture capitalists go to their website and sign up for their service, 30% are converting. But when a normal person goes to their website and gets their service, 1% convert. 1%. So, you know, so they can't find a scalable way of growing. And so they were asking, what do you think? How do you think we should grow? And I said, you know what? I don't think it's a business that scales. Like, I, it just, I think you're charging for something that there's a very limited market for. And I think you're getting, let's call it 80% of that market with your current ways of going. And so I think you'll grow very slowly. People will come and they'll talk about it. But, you know, this is not a business that grows to be a $100 million company. 
And you know, for them, that was a hard thing because they built all their numbers and all their investment strategy of getting VC money and everything else around this, this insane conversion rate that just did not exist. And so you know, figuring out what the numbers are in your business that matter that's like, it's like the most important thing. And it's, you know, it's, it's how are you going to monetize? How are you going to be successful? And then what are those numbers to do that? Again, if you're an advertising business on mobile, it's the amount of hours that the people are on that, that app. How much are they opening it? What, what causes them to open it again? Things like that. That's really the important thing. And not getting fooled by the law of small numbers, which is when you have just a few people coming to your website and they're converting at 30%, all of a sudden you now make all your projections based on that and you think you're going to make it build a hundred million dollar company and you start to get some traffic in and things just go bonkers. The last thing I'll leave with is you're not Apple. Don't use them as a metaphor. I try not to. You know, I hear a lot of times, well, if Apple, Apple does this or this is the way that Apple does it. And I think, you know, looking at some of these big companies can be very deceiving in terms of what they can get away with and what we can get away with. And I think being realistic about what you can get away with as a startup to build your business and then when that transitions to the point that, yes, then you can sort of break some of the rules and do some of this stuff. But in the early days, I think you have to do a little bit extra to get there. So I hope uh, everyone enjoyed that. Uh, I go out there and make your customers care. And if anyone has any questions, we have uh, almost four minutes left. So happy to do that. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Any questions? No? Yep. All right. So in terms of how do you drive scalable traffic or? So I've never really had luck in partnerships. Um, so the question is how do you drive, I think is how do you drive traffic to your site sort of scalably with maybe a like service or someone else like a partnership or something like affiliate traffic, things like that. I've had a lot of trouble. The only people that I've seen make affiliate traffic work are scammers. And scammers do a great job at it because what they do is they optimize every single click to get to the goal of making money. They're not optimizing a product. So like my life is a great example of it. It's, it's you know, if the founder's here, I'm sorry, but it's a scam product. Like it is built to convert you, to get your credit card so that you can never get it off and it charges you every month. That's all it does. There's no product behind it. And any product that's there is just to get you to get that credit card converted. And so that's where I've seen like affiliate traffic work and that's where I've seen it work at scale with like real companies, real products where you're trying to like solve something. I've never actually seen scalable stuff other than maybe like a Google AdWords or something where it's, you know, driving traffic, you know, directly for what your target audience is. If there is, if there are keywords that are around it, like we sold calling cards online, you buy the term calling cards, like something like that, which is a sort of a direct uh, scalable. But I've never seen it like work with, a, with affiliate networks where it's real sort of traffic. A lot of those clicks are just sort of crap that's being pushed around. Anything else? Yep. Now, what do you think is the best way to give customer support? So, phone, chat, email? So, this is, I think this is a great question. So, what's the best way to give customer support? So, in the beginning, I would do like everything uh, give your Skype thing out, give out your phone numbers, give out everything. I actually put my mobile phone number on all of our companies. So, and no one, you know, up to this date, I'd say five or six people have called it. And those people that have called it have had legitimately gotten screwed by us in some way by. You know, by accident, I mean, when you have customers that are doing stuff and you're billing credit cards, you know, sometimes people do fall through the loop and sometimes your customer service doesn't do a good job. And those have been awesome. So I, I say go from your cell phone to your email addresses to everything. Have everything out there because you want to hear it. I mean, if someone's pissed, the best way to defuse that bomb is to have them call you, scream at you for two minutes and say, we're really sorry, we're going to fix it right now. And then that customer ends up being your best customer and adding like more users than you, you, know, you could possibly do in blog posts and you know, talks about it and everything else. So I, I think you just, just go wild with it. And then as you get bigger, you do have to restrict it because at the end of the day, you do have to make money and you know, supplying phone support for your business might, not just, might be something that you can't do uh, you know, with, with what you're making off of a customer. Any other questions? We have 40 seconds, no? Oh, they're ready? All right. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Jamie, thanks a lot.